people know that neurology is basically a mathematics. That means there is a correct answer based on fundamental findings. And the fundamental findings are symptomatology based on which you should look for it, answer the diagnosis. In neurology, symptomatology is basically is close to the disorder of normal function. As you all know that in neurology, there are different parts. And symptomatology means the normal impairment of normal function, that is dysfunction. When there is dysfunction of an organ, and that dysfunction is actually presented with symptomatology. That is the fundamental basis of any disease so far. As you also know that symptomatology is basically based on the organ based, that is the organ which is involved. And there are few and could be many systemic symptoms. In neurology, to be honest, I tell you, most of the symptomatology are organ based. So we should know critically the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of neuro of nervous system. Otherwise, it is very difficult to put a diagnosis on the findings of symptomatology. So as a result of that, uh, I am now going to my presentation. <clears throat> yes. So here I go. Here I see that actually what I have set in my mind that how should I approach to this topic of symptomatology of neurological diagnosis. I felt that if I really describe the different functions of different part of a body, a brain or, or nervous system, then I can discuss about the dysfunction and then I can also say about the symptomatology. And if I first of all, as I mentioned, that before I start, I should go for a little bit of anatomy of the nervous system. All you know, the nervous system is basically divided in central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The structures which lies within the parameter is called central nervous system. The structures which lies outside the parameter is called peripheral nervous system. And today I will discuss about almost all part, central nervous system and peripheral system. With the honor to time, I'll try to finish my lecture in one hour. So I, I humbly request all of the panelists and all the participants, they might carefully uh, listen to my topic. So first of all, you know the brain, brain has cerebral hemispheres, diencephalon, brain stem and cerebellum. In the hemisphere, you know, there is a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe, and the encephalon, basal ganglia, and thalamus. In the brain stem consists of midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata, and cerebellum. This is a very gross, gross anatomy, not a very in detail or minor anatomy. In the next is the spinal cord, which has got three components, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. As you all know, the spinal starts from the pro magnum and ends in the lower border of L1 or the upper border of L2. That is why there could be a little bit small number component. And now is the peripheral nerves, which contains cranial nerves and the spinal nerves, and other is the autonomic nervous system. If you know that cranial nerves is, arises from the brain stem, but when it crosses the brain stem, it becomes a part of the peripheral nervous system. So when you talk about the peripheral nervous system, it means the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. I will little bit address about the autonomic nervous system if I have time. Now I come to the topic. Yes, my dear participants, here I have discussed about the functions of different parts of the brain. That is really a very cross function because they have got many, many functions which are not clinically important. 
I have tried to put forward or focused on those functions, those are clinically very important. Frontal lobe, as you all know, that it functions mainly, mainly on voluntary motor movement, motor speech, executive functions like cognition, behavior, personality, and social sense. On the other hand, if there is impairment of functions of this part, what will cause? Then there will be weakness of opposite side of the body, motor dysphagia, forgetfulness, loss of social sense, abnormal behavior. You know, so when a patient presents with weakness of opposite side, motor dysphagia, forgetfulness, and other part of cognitive impairment that will locate, pointing to the lesion in the frontal lobe. Similarly, the parietal lobe, cause obviously there is a, uh, the brain hemisphere, right and left hemisphere, one is dominant, one another is non-dominant. Usually, left hemisphere is dominant in almost all person, but in right-handed person, left-handed person, left hemisphere is also do dominant, about 90% cases. Coming to parietal lobe, which is we all know that purely sensory, functionally, but anatomically there is different component. It is the perception of all modality of sense, and it has got receptive center for speech in the dominant side. So when there is parietal lobe lesion, there is impairment or loss of sensation in opposite side. And there is receptive dysphagia, which is classically known as anomic dysphagia. That means the patient cannot name the object. He can speak fluently. He can talk fluently. He can understand everything, but he cannot name the object. If, a, if you put a pen in front of him, he cannot name. If you put a watch in front of him, he cannot name. So this is called anomic dysphagia. And there is also in addition, in the non-parietal, non-dominant parietal lobe, apraxia and agnosia. That means true identification of the object. That is a part of non-dominant parietal lobe dysfunction. So you see, whenever you see a anomic dysphagia, immediately point the lesion in the dominant parietal lobe, area 39 and area 30. Coming to the temporal lobe, where there is, there is accumulation of the language comprehension part, hearing, emotion, and memory. You know that when you talk, when you discuss about the dysphagia, what will happen? If I ask one person, what is your name? Then he will tell, I will eat. What does it mean? He, the answer is not appropriate. I asked his name but he told me that he will not eat. That this is called receptive dysphagia. Why there is problem in understanding? Because when I ask the question, what is your name? He heard the question through the auditory, uh, through the ear, and this auditory radiation goes to temporal lobe. And there it is comprehended. That means what I am asking, that is understanding in the temporal lobe. When the lesion is temporal lobe, that is not comprehended. He doesn't understand what I am asking. So he answers in a different way. This is called sensory dysphagia or bhannik dysphagia, or this is called comprehensive language problem. As you all know, that in temporal lobe, this is in a, I think the dominant hemisphere. But in addition, in the temporal lobe, there is a very important center which is called recent memory center, which is called emotional center. So when there is lesion in the temporal lobe, there could be language problem, there could be memory impairment, there could be temporal lobe seizure, there could be hearing problem and emotional problem. So when there is lesion, they will produce sensory dysphagia, hallucination, deletion, memory loss, and complex partial seizure that should be kept in our mind. Next is the optic or occipital lobe. As you know, occipital lobe basically consists important for the visual setting. With is a center for visual processing, 
And when there is lesion in the occipital lobe, it gives rise to cortical blindness, Anton syndrome, and Berlin syndrome. Let me say something about the Anton syndrome, which is basically an inattention syndrome. That means there is lesion not in the occipital lobe, there is also in the parietal lobe. When there is combination or connect, at least in the connection between the occipital and parietal lobe, that gives the Anton syndrome. What is this? That is called visual agnosia, visual ataxia, and visual apraxia. Visual agnosia means the patient cannot find the object in, the, in his visual territory. Optic ataxia means patient cannot fix his eye to the object. Agnosia means patient cannot. Apraxia means cannot locate the object in the visual field. This is all of our sensory perception problem, inattention problem. And there is another syndrome which is called Berlin syndrome, which is really the cortical blindness. The patient is really blind, but he denies. He denies. So whenever we see a blind man, he cannot see anything really, but he denies blindness. He just makes some hallucination. Yes, I can see the color. I can see your shirt. I can see something, but this is some imaginary complement thinking. But this is called cortical blindness or Berlin syndrome. Here I should mention that if you have the lesion in one, occipital cortex that will produce hemianopia. If you have bilateral cortical, occipital cortical in front, that will produce cortical blindness. Then they tell us, who is the pacemaker of the brain? All sensations from different parts of the body are carried to the thalamus, except one, which is the first nerve, olfactory nerve. This thalamus then convey mm -hmm. all moral sensation to the cerebral cortex mm -hmm. in, the, in the parietal lobe of the opposite side. And in thalamus, there is also a subcortical speech center. Subcortical speech center, which is a sensory conducting speech problem. When there is lesion in the thalamus, it will produce hemisensory loss. Thalamic syndrome, thalamic dysplasia. Here I should clearly say that when a patient presents with a hemisensory loss at one side of the body, that is, diagnosis usually two. One, either lesion in thalamus or functional, or functional. In cortical, parietal lobe lesion does not cause hemisensory loss. I repeat, parietal lobe lesion does not cause hemisensory loss because cortical lesion, the fundamental principle is a focal lesion, is a focal presentation. So hemisensory loss has two diagnoses, thalamic lesion or functional. Similarly, there is also a thalamic dysplasia, which is a sensory conducting dysplasia. And another syndrome, which is the thalamic syndrome. Following a stroke, about 30% patient may have a excruciating pain, which is burning in nature, that is occurring in the hemiplegic side, in paralysis side, and that is very, very refractory to the treatment. I usually tell to my student that if a doctor can cure, cure thalamic pain, he will get the Nobel Prize. He will get the Nobel Prize because this pain is so distressing. Passion often and on comes for the solution, but we are really helpless. The other thing is that remember for the student, thalamic lesion does not cause hemiplasia, but clinically we see hemiplasia in a thalamic stroke. This is because of this is because of because of internal capsular involvement which lies just lateral to the thalamus. Keep in mind. So thalamic lesion itself does not cause hemiplegia. But in practice, we see hemiplegia in a thalamic stroke or hemorrhage, but this is because of internal capsule lesion. Coming to the basal ganglia, 
who said the most important function is refining motor movement. And involvement in basal ganglia popularly, it causes resting tumor and other involuntary movements depends on the structure involved and the rigidity. The classical triad of resting tumor, involuntary movement, and rigidity gives and puts to a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But remember, all of the basal ganglia has different parts. Different part produces different type of lesion. If it is coded nucleus, it causes chorea. If it is an putamen, it causes dystonia. It was, if it is subthalamic nucleus, it causes thalamic hemivalismus. It is a basal ganglia hemivalismus. Substantial nigra lesion causes Parkinson's disease. So there are different anatomical component and lesion produce different type of presentation. Coming to cerebellum, it is a wonderful organ lying outside the main stream of the brain, but it, it coordinates the brain. It, its main function is coordination and equilibrium. And the dysfunction of the cerebellum causes intention tremor, dysdiadokinesia, dysmetria, dysenergia, hypotonia, scanning if speak atasia. Among all these, most important hallmark of cerebellar lesion is intention tremor. Intention tremor. I tell you that the in case of cerebellar disease, if a patient special presents with unilateral, and here I tell you that cerebellar symptoms is usually ipsilateral, but cerebral and brainstem lesion usually contralateral. But usual cerebellar ipsilateral lesion, when a patient presents with unilateral acute cerebellar lesion, unilateral acute cerebellar lesion, diagnosis is three. One is a stroke, second is hemorrhage, third is trauma. There could be many other things. I think he who is a very good clinician who thinks very minimum possible diagnosis, not a big or a wide list of diagnoses. So clinically, when a patient presents with acute inrectal cerebellar lesion, diagnosis is stroke, acute stroke, abscess, and there is trauma. When there is bilateral acute cerebellar presentation, first diagnosis is infective. First diagnosis infective. Second is toxic, toxic. And third is metabolic, third is metabolic. On the other hand, when there is chronic unilateral cerebellar feature, first diagnosis is exome, intracranial space occupying lesion. And second diagnosis is cerebral congenital agenesis or AVN or vascular malformations. And when there is bilateral progressive cerebral lesion, the diagnosis is either degenerative, mostly degenerative, then second is hypothyroid. Second is hypothyroid. But never ever forget about paramuplastic syndrome. The cerebellum is the hallmark or key part that is involved in the brain in paraneoplastic syndrome. In paraneoplastic, without any other reason behind, there is cerebellar presentations. And these cerebellar presentations clinically may be very difficult to exclude from other possibilities. But when you go for MRI, in MRI, in paraneoplastic, the cerebellum will be normal. In spite of normal MRI cerebellum, there is cerebellar dysfunction that keeps high suspicion of paraneoplastic syndrome. Coming to midbrain, with a very small one centimeter, one inch, one inch in diameter. Midbrain, there are important few structures. The third, fourth cranial nerve, ascending and descending tract, reticular activating system, and pupillary fiber. Obviously, when there is a lesion to the midbrain, there could be canyon nerve palsy, as for example, third, fourth canyon nerve palsy, involvement of the descending tract, the ascending tract, involvement of the reticular activating system, and also the people, also the people. 
one thing that when the lesion in the midbrain, the common cause of the lesion in the midbrain is a stroke. Second is the trauma. Third is the infection. And fourth is the tumor. Fourth is the tumor. Stroke is the most important cause. So it gives rise to few syndrome that cause the Weber syndrome, Claudius syndrome, Benedict syndrome, North Nagel syndrome, Perinor syndrome. And in the Weber syndrome, as you all know, that there is involvement of the third nerve, ipsilateral third nerve, contralateral hemiplegia. The classical presentation of brain stem involvement usually give rise to cross paralysis. That means ipsilateral hemiplegia and contralateral, ipsilateral cannula palsy and contralateral hemiplegia. That is a characteristic features of brain stem lesion. So in midbrain, there are a few syndromes, which is Weber syndrome, where there is third nerve palsy, ipsilateral third nerve, contralateral hemiplegia. In the Claudi syndrome, that is period of third nerve and ipsilateral hemiplegia, but an ipsilateral cerebellar ataxia because of involvement of ascending spinal cerebellar tract. The Benedict syndrome, where there is third nerve palsy, ipsilateral, contralateral hemiplegia, and involuntary movement. Involuntary movement. In the North Nagel syndrome, the third nerve palsy, and ipsilateral, and contralateral, ipsilateral, cerebral findings. So, what happens here? Third nerve, fourth nerve is always involved. But the Syndromes are separated depending on the hemiplegia. In somewhere it is hemiplegia, in the benetic it is ataxia, and in the north nagal it is involuntary movement cerebellar type. Coming to perinode, where there is involvement of the medial midbrain syndrome, where there is defect in the upward and downward movement of the eyeball. When there is lower part involvement, midbrain, lower part, failure of upward gains. When there's upper part involvement, failure of lower gains. So that is a classical presentation of midbrain involvement. So whenever you see a third or fourth nerve palsy in a patient, then please examine to find out the features of tract involvement, either hemiplegia or involuntary movement or ataxia. Coming to the pons, fifth, six, seven, eight canal nerves lie in the pons, along with the ascending and descending tracts and reticular activity system. And classical pontan lesion like the midbrain also give rise to the features of some brainstorm syndrome, which is Miller Gabler syndrome. Another is a Fobil syndrome, pontine hemorrhage, and hearing loss. In the miller gabler syndrome, there is six and seven nerve involvement in the same side and the opposite side there is hemiplegia. And Hobel syndrome is very complex where there is involvement of all the canyon nerves, fifth, six, seven, eight, all canyon nerves are involved, ipsilateral. And there is contralateral hemiparesis with the other, maybe they have involuntary movement. And there is, could be hearing loss, and there could be severe vertigo. And in the, in the pontan lesion, vertigo is a very, very important presentation. And you all know the pontan hemorrhage, which is very common in, in, in stroke. About 4% patients may present with pontan hemorrhage. And in that case, there is high fever, hemiplegia, and thin point people. People are pinpoint people, pyrexia and paralysis, classical presentation of content hemorrhage. And to look, everything depends on the classical examination, meticulous examinations. Whenever you see a canine nerve involvement, that means there is something in the brain stem if there is finding of long track deficit. Coming to the medulla oblongata. Where we see quite often 
lateral medulla is the same role. In the medulla, lower canyon knobs are involved, 9, 10th, 11, and 12th canyon knobs, along with ascending and descending tract and descending sympathetic tract, reticular activating system. And the lesion in the middle of the gut are definitely produced cross paralysis, ipsilateral canyon lap, contralateral hip plate. But there is a classical syndrome, which is Wallenberg syndrome or Pikel syndrome, posterior, inferior, cerebral, artery involvement, where there is paralysis of the canyon labs in one side, 9, 9, 10th, and 11th, and there is sensory loss in the opposite side. As a result, and there is also Horner syndrome. Ipsilateral Horner syndrome, ipsilateral 9th, 10th, and 11th canyon palsy, and contralateral hemisensory loss. Remember, remember, in the medulla, there is very, very difficult to have hemiplegia because the pyramidal tract in the brain stem, midbrain pons and medulla lies in the medial part. But almost all lesions involve the lateral part of the medulla. That is why pyramidal tract is spared. And as a result, there is no hemiplegia. Patient presents with sudden onset of acute dysphagia, sudden onset of acute dysphagia, Sensory complaint may be ignored. When you examine the patient meticulously, you might find the sensory loss. But when you examine the throat, you will definitely see palatal palsy and Horner syndrome. The so presence of Horner, palatal palsy, dysphagia, and hemisensory loss gives the diagnosis of Pikeau syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. Here I should mention one thing. The what is the function of reticular activating system that extended from the midbrain up to the upper part of the medulla, mostly in the pons. Reticular activating system is concerned for the awareness of a person. When it is involved, there is impairment of the awareness. When there is unilateral lesion of reticular activity system that produces semicoma. When there is bilateral involvement of reticular activity system that produces coma. So when a patient presents with coma, then you analyze, the, is it a structural lesion or a something other than structural lesion? Remember, a structural lesion, there is coma and involvement of the brain, of the pupil. But in other causes of coma, beyond the structural causes, people is usually spared. People is usually, so coma with sparing of the people, most likely non-structural lesions. But coma with involvement of people, most likely it is a structural lesion. Remember, in medicine, there is no hard and fast rule. But in poisoning, as you all know, there could be involvement of people. In Pantan hemorrhage, there is involvement of people, but there are a few exceptions. But in general, this is the reality. The another thing is, now coming to spinal cord. Remember, when there is involvement of the brain as a whole, that means global involvement of the brain, global, not focal. Many, many lesions produce this focal, stroke, tumor, trauma, anything. But there are other causes of global involvement in the brain. When there is global involvement of the brain presenting as encephalitis, encephalopathy, disorientation, restless, incoherent talk, no focal sign, fever, the cause is usually fine. Global involvement of the brain, no evidence of focal cause is usually five. One, infective, two, toxic, three, metabolic, four, hypoxic, five, traumatic. Five, trauma. Many a times trauma does, does not give rise to focal lesion. Bland trauma or deep seated trauma may not give rise to focal lesion. So when there is a global presentation, global impairment of brain 
usual causes is fine. I beg apology. There could be many other causes beyond this, but always keep in, keep in your mind these five causes of global involvement of the brain. Next is the spinal cord. We see the spinal cord extends from the, as I mentioned, from a magnum up to the lower border of L1 or upper border of L2. It is divided structures containing of anterior horn cell, posterior horn cell, and important tracts. Let, in the meantime, among which there are a few columns, lateral column and posterior column. In the lateral, remember, I should say one thing, there are many structures in the spinal cord. All are not equally important. All are not clinically important. So you should keep in mind the most important tracts and their functions. So I have tried to mention all these possibilities. One, anterior horn cell, posterior horn cell, and in the lateral column, most important lateral cortical spinal tract, ascending spinothermic tract, dorsal and ventral, so it should be ventral spinal cerebellar tract. In the posterior column, classically tract of gold and tract of Buddha. All of know that what is the functions of anterior cell? It is a lower motor neuron cell, lower motor neuron cell. When the lesion the anterior horn cell, it causes wasting, adiplexia, fasciculation. Remember, fasciculation is a hallmark for anterior horn cell involvement. We can rarely see fasciculation in peripheral nerve involvement, but rare thing rarely happen, common thing commonly happen. So whenever you see fasciculation, it will point you to the anterior horn cell, unless proved otherwise. When the lesion in posterior horn cell, it causes sensory impairment, all model of sensory impairment. And the other track I'll know, lateral corticospinal tract, it carries the pain, touch, and temperature. And as in the, sorry, cortical tract, uh, descending motor tract, which is called pyramidal tract. It comes from the cerebral cortex up to the anterior horn cell to the opposite side. It causes the motor function, it conveys the motor uh, functions. And the ascending expansive tract, as you all know, it carries the pain, touch, and temperature to the opposite side of the body. And dorsal and ventral spinal cerebral tract, it carries ipsilateral, unconscious, proprioceptic impulse. I repeat, it carries ipsilateral, unconscious, proprioceptic impulse. Coming to posterior color, tract of gall and tract of Buddha, gastrilis and fasciculus, gastrilis and fasciculus. They carry ipsilateral pain, vibration, sorry, vibration, position, and half touch, fine touch, vibration, position, and fine touch from the same side of the body. The tact of gall, lower half, and tact of Buddha, upper half. So why I am telling this anatomy and the function? Because if you do not know the respect function of a tract, it is very difficult to point out the lesion. This is, I mentioned that beside this, <coughs> but clinically in the spinal cord, we divide the cord in a complete cord lesion, hemisection of the cord or brown sequence syndrome or lateral cord syndrome or central cord syndrome. As I have shown you the picture in the last slide, you can see the central area that is called, this is a central area. This is a, this is a central area. This is a lateral area, this is a posterior area. So lesion could be in the posterior area, lesion could be lateral area, lesion could be central. In the central, it is called central cord syndrome. If a lateral, lateral cord syndrome. If it's complete it's spinal cord, complete cord syndrome. And if it's one half of the cord is called hemicord syndrome. So, According to the involvement structures, there will be the clinical presentations. In the central cord syndrome, classically, bladder is involved first. There is also involvement of pain and temperature and fiber. In the hemicord, there is ipsilateral, the ipsilateral pyramidal tract sign and contralateral spinothalamic sign. In addition, there is also 
uh, anterior horn cell or posterior horn cell initially. Remember, how can you really localize the spinal cord? Like before I, that, I also tell you that spinal cord lesion usually causes bladder involvement. There is definite sensory loss, spinal shock in acute uh, cord lesion, spastic cord paresis when there is cervical cord lesion, spastic paraplegia, thoracic cord lesion, unas medullaris, which the lesion in T12 to L2 syndrome is a mixed. You can find the combination of upper motor and lower motor features, the legs, along with bladder involvement. Also, a cord equina syndrome, which also causes the 12 lumbar, lumbar 12 to, to lumbar 2 to coccyx up to all care, lumbar 2 to all coccyx and up to the sec, sec, coccyx nerve, sectal nerve and coccyx, all nerves are involved. That is typically lower motor neuron type. There is areplexia, sensory loss, along with blood involvement. So difference between the conus and corda. Conus is a cord lesion, lower cord lesion. And corda is a radicular lesion. So in the cord lesion, combination of upper motor, lower motor, and corda from the only radiculopathy. That is the main difference. And blood involvement is also there. There are other points of difference that is very not important. But remember, whenever you see a spinal cord lesion, how can you really localize? First of all, you decide, is it a cord lesion from this presentation, blood involvement, sensory level, and others? What is the lesion? Usually, the site of lesion is identified on the basis of three signs. At the level of lesion, there is more motor neuron feature because of involvement of anterior horn cells. Here, below the lesion, there is upper motor neuron sign because of periodontal tract involvement. And also, there is level of sensory, definite level of sensory loss because of spinothalamic tract lesion. These three will guide you to find out the site of lesion. Remember, if you have, if you see a case of paraplegia or quadriplegia, if you clinically examine the patient to find out the site of lesion, if you do not examine the spine, your examination is incomplete. So a spine examination in case of paraplegia, quadriplegia is a must. Remember it. Because simple exa spine examination will definitely give you a diagnosis. If you see the he give us, then you can put a diagnosis. So that is the important. There is, a, uh, there is spinal shock. Acute spinal cord lesion may produce a spinal shock. That means there is loss of power, loss of tone, loss of reflex. But then how will you differentiate this spinal shock from Guillain-Barre syndrome? Open and on. Usually there is mistake from the students. The Guillain-Barre syndrome also present with quadruplasia. But acute spinal shock in the cervical cord lesion may present with quadruplasia. Then how will you differentiate? Listen carefully. Differentiation is based on three things. First, bladder involvement. In cord lesion, the blood involvement, but in Guillain-Barre syndrome, usually, usually no blood involvement. If there is blood involvement in Guillain-Barre syndrome, consider other diagnosis. Consider other diagnosis. So first of all, blood involvement. Second, plantar. Plantar might be absent, but it could be extensive in the presence of all drugs absent. And third, sensory loss. Sensory loss. So you can really differentiate if you really examine the patient meticulously. There is no nothing beyond your examination. Next, I come to it, another chapter, which is called uh, the cranial nerve involvements and spinal nerve. And I am, yeah, I am really worried that I, whether I can finish in time because the cranial nerve and spinal nerve is a very, very big chapter, very big chapter. And I feel 
this class is not only for the for, for the recapitulation of my favorite colleagues, but also for the postgraduate students. So this is basically what I have seen. I have tried to address in detail of all. May not be full coverage of the scenario. So let us start. Can you love? <coughs> <clears throat> First, can you love anosmia and parosmia? May not be clinically important, but in the COVID, in the COVID, that has really teached us and our point attention to the picture of anosmia. The first and early presentation of COVID could be anosmia. There are other presentations of anosmia, frontal nerve tumor, up the, uh, uh, new, uh, new, uh, atrophy of the nasal mucosa, only there are three different causes. The, the second canyon lab, which is very, very important and very, very important for the neurology particularly. In the second canyon lab, we see dimness of vision or loss of vision. There could be papilledema or there could be optic atrophy. Whenever you see a unilateral papilledema, Papillism in one eye that gives that could be due to optic neuritis, Foster Kennedy syndrome, retinal venous thrombosis, and anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. When the bilateral papillism, remember, most important cause is raised intracranial pressure. Next is intra idiopathic intracranial hypertension, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy optic neuritis and hypercapnia syndrome, hypercapnia syndrome. So clinically, clinically, whenever you see unilateral or bilateral, then you can define possibly what might be the cause. Similarly, optic atrophy, when the unilateral optic atrophy, foster kind of syndrome, optic neuritis, anti ischemic optic neuropathy and traumatic. But when the bilateral optic atrophy, it could be the consequence of raised intracranial pressure, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, anti ischemic neuropathy, PES syndrome, and hereditary metabolic. This could be toxic. This could be the most important cause of bilateral optic atrophy. I should mention here that I request my students to look into the fundus very, very meticulously, which is often ignored, often ignored. Then the dimness of vision. Dimness of vision could be, could be two types. One could be complete loss of vision or could be loss of part of the vision, anopia. When there is loss of part of a vision field that could present to his anopia. This anopia is hemianopia. When there is heteronymous hemianopia, that means bitemporal visual field impairment, the lesion lies in the cellar area. When there is bitemporal visual field loss, the lesion lies in the cellar area, most common pituitary adenoma, then the other lesion, other lesion lies there. When there is homonymous hemianopia, homonymous hemianopia, lesion usually lies retrochiasmal, optic tract and occipital cortex. So when there is impairment of vision, decide, is it hemianopia or it is, if it is hemianopia, it is homogeneous, homonymous, or heteronymous. If heteronymous lesion here, if homonymous lesion there. Coming to the dimness of vision, total loss of vision, when there is unilateral total loss of vision, in, that is one eye visual loss, the lesion lies either in retina or in optic. Monocular blindness is lesion lies either in optic knot or in retina. But when there is bi biocular visual impairment, lesion lies in the chiasma or reptochiasma. So that is a gross difference between the two, monocular and biocular. That should be kept in mind. So when there is 
transient monocular visual loss. That what are the causes of a patient complains of sudden onset of blindness persists for a few minutes then goes monocular. The causes are migraine. Most important cause is M aerosis fumex, or it is called TIA, carotid artery TIA. Then it's migraine, cerebral hyperperfusion, seizure, press, visual obscuration, the age ICP, and head injury. Monocular transient visual loss. Monocular non-progressive visual loss. Retinal artery occlusion, anterior ischemic neuropathy, posterior ischemic neuropathy, trauma, and functional, functional hysterical blindness. When there is progressive monocular visual loss, progressive, the first one is transient, second one non-progressive, third one is progressive. Optic neuropathy due to other causes, optic neuroitis, toxic and metabolic. Remember, dear friends and my students, I have tried to consider the most common causes. There could be many other causes of this kind of lesions, but as a, as a clinician, I think you should consider as minimum as possible as a differential diagnosis. And then biocular transient visual loss, cerebral hypoperfusion, migraine, seizure, pituitary apoplexy, press, functional, acute raise ICP. Then biocular non-progressive visual loss, occipital infarct, mitral, bilateral optic neuropathy, pituitary apoplexy, head trauma, functional and toxic. Biocular progressive visual loss, optic neuroitis, compressive sarcoidosis age ICP, head is optic neuropathy, toxic metabolic paraneoplastic. These are the common causes of visual impairment. Coming to the third nerve policy, which could be unilateral and which could be bilateral. So if you have unilateral third nerve policy, Unilateral third nerve palsy is usually due to trauma, tumor, PCOM aneurysm, and stroke. Bilateral third nerve palsy, stroke, tumor, GBS, CIDP, Lyme disease, and Miller Fisher syndrome. Similarly, fourth nerve give rise to vertical diplopia and trauma because the most important cause is trauma. So when there is a process, I should say, third, fourth, and sixth canyon nerve usually discussed together because they supply the extraocular muscles and the people. Whenever there is a third, fourth, and sixth nerve policy, they may present with tosis, diplopia, hystectus, squint, and pupillary changes. There could be a third nerve, actually. Third nerve causes all of this. Sixth nerve may not cause, may, does not cause ptosis, but may, does not cause pupillary changes. Fourth nerve does not cause ptosis, does not cause pupillary changes. So third nerve may cause all of this. Fourth nerve only cause the uh, diplopia or nystagmus, squint, and sixth nerve may cause diplopia, nystagmus, squint but may not cause, does not cause dosis and people are the changes. So third nerve pulse unilateral, that could be due to cause that I mentioned. Fourth nerve, fifth nerve cause, fifth nerve, I am talking now about peripheral, these nerves coming from the brain stem, passes through the spaces and lesion these spaces may cause fifth nerve, trigeminal neuralgia, heartbeat, the hemifacial sensory loss, weakness of muscles and mastications. Sixth nerve could be unilateral and bilateral. In the unilateral sixth nerve, maybe diabetes, viral, tumor, stroke, bilateral, raised ICP, GBS, CIDP. Remember, when there is unilateral sixth nerve palsy in a young man, unilateral sixth nerve palsy in a young man, it is nasopharyngeal carcinoma unless proved otherwise. In retinal sixth nerve palsy in a young man, it is nasopharyngeal carcinoma, unless proved otherwise. When there is bilateral sixth nerve palsy, 
it is because of raised ICP and pro unless proved otherwise. They are the key and guideline which should consider in front whenever you see the patients. This is a complete tosis in left eye. Remember, complete tosis is always a nerve lesion. It never occurs in myasthenia. It never occurs in myopathy. A complete tosis, complete tosis is always a nerve lesion. It never occurs in myasthenia gravis. It never occurs in uh, myopathy, ocular myopathy. You see, because of third nerve, the eye has deviated outside. This is bilateral, you see, bilateral tosis, more micrite. This is a classical case of myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia. Incomplete bilateral tosis, maybe unilateral, incomplete unilateral tosis. Diagnosis commonly two. One is myasthenia gravis, two, Horner syndrome. And three could be partial third nerve. Three could be partial, of course, exclusion of the congenital one. The bilateral similarly, partial tosis also. You see the bilateral partial tosis, as I mentioned, the left sixth nerve palsy. The eye has deviated to the medium, left sixth nerve palsy. That is bilateral six nerve palsy. I have deviated. The classical bilateral six nerve palsy. So the eye has deviated toward medially. That's so deviation of the eyeball toward the nose, medial squint is a bilateral six nerve palsy. Then coming to the third, fourth, and six nerve involvement together, as I have mentioned. So when you see a case of ophthalmoplasia, third, fourth, and sixth nerve, patient cannot move the eyeball. If the people is normal, considered myasthenia gravis. If the people is involved, considered nerve paralysis. And to find out the site of lesion, third, fourth, and sixth, you should also examine the fifth nerve. First division of the fifth nerve and second division of the fifth nerve. So when the third, fourth, and sixth nerve is involved, the lesion cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure syndrome. In case of cavernous sinus, third, fourth, sixth, and first division of fifth nerve. In case of superior orbital fissure, third, fourth, sixth, first and second division of fifth nerve. So you should examine the fifth nerve as well. When there is Third, fourth, sixth, plus second nerve, Tolosahan syndrome, orbital apex syndrome. That second nerve passes through the orbital apex, involve Tolosahan syndrome and orbital apex syndrome. And seven nerve, as you all know, Bell's palsy, bilateral, GBS, the ADP, unilateral, bilateral. Here I should mention one thing. Sometimes we see bilateral facial nerve palsy. This could be very early presentation of GBS, very early presentation of GBS. When there's eight nerve palsy, obviously unilateral, unilateral hearing problem, and could be unilateral or could be bilateral, and consider about the present present with severe vertigo, severe vertigo when there is vestibular involvement, and giving the diagnosis of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or mini disease and consider eight nerve palsy. If this along with fifth nerve palsy, CP angle tumor, CP angle tumor, eight nerve, unilateral eight nerve and unilateral fifth nerve, maybe seven nerve. This is a picture of CP angle tumor. Nine, tenth lateral palsy, as you know, if you examine patient can develop with dysphagia, hoarseness of voice, and the 12th nerve, this ipsilateral tongue palsy. When there is 9, 10, 11 together, this is called jugular foramen syndrome, and could be involved in basal meningitis, myasthenia gravis, and polymyositis. I should focus more a little bit on the 9, 10, and particularly the 12th carrier nerve. All of you know that 12th carrier nerve ipsilateral produces the deviation of the tongue to the same side. 
when there is bilateral tongue palsy, maybe upper motor neuron, maybe lower motor neuron, please consider motor neuron disease, motor neuron disease, commonest cause of bilateral 12 nerve palsy. They present with speech problem, swallowing problem, and features of pseudobulbar palsy, pseudobulbar palsy. So you will see this is the really picture you should examine whether there is a single nerve involvement or combination of nerve involvement. When a single nerve, different pathology, combination, different pathology. That is the reality. Then as I told you that third, fourth, sixth, fourth division, I have mentioned earlier that I have mentioned third, fourth, sixth, and first and second Tolosan syndrome, orbital fissure syndrome, third, second, third, fourth, sixth, orbital apex. This is only I mentioned. Second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, Jacquard syndrome, rectus spindle spaces. So, series of cannula involvement. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, is a Jacquard syndrome. The lesion lies in rectal spinoidal space. Rarely we see unilateral all cannula involvement, first to 12. First to 12, unilateral cannula involvement. That is, is because of chordoma, because of chordoma. That chordoma usually may present with hemicranial syndrome. This fifth and fifth and sixth, I told me, I mentioned, I don't want to repeat. Fifth, eight, seven, nine, CP angle tumor, nine, jugular problem. This is already I have told, mentioned. Now we're coming to the peripheral nerves. I think I have almost come to the end. Maybe I need further five minutes or seven minutes. Then I, I want to finish. This is a picture that shows how a spinal nerve is formed. You can see here that you can see here this is anterior horn cell, posterior horn cell. The ventral root, the dorsal ganglia, dorsal root. The dorsal root and ventral root from the ramus. This trunk, this trunk divides dorsal rami and the ventral rami. All these ventral rami from the plexus, upper limb and lower limb. Dorsal rami goes back, paraspinal meninges. And these nerves are enriched by sympathetic component, white rami and gray rami. This is how the spinal nerve is formed. Why I have put this picture here? Because if you consider the spinal nerve, the spinal nerve is a mixed nerve because they contain sensory, motor, and autonomic component. Autonomic component. So whenever you consider the peripheral nerve involvement, the spinal nerve involvement, obviously there will be a both combination of motor deficit, sensory deficit, and autonomic deficit. Sensory, the sensory component coming from is dorsal root, motor component coming from ventral root. Here, mixture of all and the division contains all component. So usually, the peripheral nerves are mixed now. Maybe rarely motor and sensory predominant presentation. No definite level of sensory loss. It is only the dermatome. Dermatome wise sensory loss. No blood involvement except cauda equina. More distal presentation than the proximal and the classical types of mononeuropathy, mononeural multiplex, and polyneuropathy. In case of motor signs, there could be wasting, areplexia, fasciculation, and sensory sign tingling, paresthesia, numbness, pain and needle sensory loss, autonomic, hair fall on the skin color changes, color change, beetle nail, decreased sweating and postural hypotensions. The common causes of mononeuropathy is compressive, traumatic, vasculitic, diabetes mellitus, and leprosy. And mononeuropathy multiplex, again, leprosy, diabetes, vasculitis, immune-mediated. The most important is polyneuropathy, which is common cause of diabetic, toxic, metabolic, deficiency, malignancy, drugs, CIDP, GBS, many, many, many causes, many hundreds of causes of polyneuropathy. Remember, whenever you see a case of polyneuropathy in an young, 
consider familial, familial Charcot's married to disease. In the middle age, consider toxic and diabetic. In elderly, consider paraneoplastic syndrome besides the common causes of polyneuropathy. I have come to the last slide where I have showed that how can you proceed to a case of paraplegia or quadriplegia. In a case of paraplegia or quadriplegia, decide, is it upper motor or lower motor? If it is upper motor and if there is bladder involvement, then if there is bladder, consider if there is upper motor, then look for bladder involvement. When there is involvement of the bladder, consider acute transverse myelitis, spinal as well, conus medullary When there is no blood involvement, consider degenerative, toxic, genetic, motor neuron disease. When there are other things, when there is not blood involved, peripheral cord lesion, peripheral cord lesion, not that, say lateral cord lesion. Coming to lower motor type, involve the bladder, consider the bladder. If lower motor, bladder is involved, then diagnosis spinal shock, quadra equida. If bladder is not involved, consider peripheral neuropathy and muscle disease. This is simple flow chart that may not be sufficient, may not contain many of the aspects, but in the bedside, if you keep in, in your mind, I think many a times, you can come to a diagnosis. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues, what I can tell you, the neurology is a mathematics. Please look into the pictures and findings and try to correlate these findings to the underlying part of the brain, which produces these kinds of functions. And lastly, remember, Always, we treat the patient, not the investigations. Keep in your mind what you see in your in examination. That is your mandate. And try to put a diagnosis initially on those findings. With the three features, I thank everybody for patient sharing. If anything left, I have sincerely apologize. If anything not, not clearly understood, I again apologize for my inability. Thank you very much.